many people, saber tooths are the ultimate super predators. It's a tried and true body plan that has evolved independently at least four times over the last 50 million years. Each time there has been a trend toward increasingly extreme designs with ever longer more deadly canine teeth and increasingly powerful muscular bodies. But which of these separate radiations culminated in the all-time most extreme saber tooth ever? Keep watching if you want to find out. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist and you're watching Real Paleontology. Now in previous episodes of my Super Predator series, you might have just noticed that I've featured a bunch of saber-tooths, Smilodon, Xenosmilus, Homotherium, Thylacosmilus and Innostrensibia. And a few weeks ago, you might remember, I also published an episode looking at why the saber-tooth body plan has disappeared and re-evolved so many times. So despite the fact that these distinct saber-tooth radiations have evolved independently from different ancestors, within each of them there has been a general trend over time to converge on a similar, increasingly extreme body plan. These common features include increasingly long, flattened and curved upper canine teeth and decreasingly powerful bite forces, together with increasingly powerful necks and forelimbs, as well as a host of additional features that improve the animal's stability and capacity to get up close and personal, to mix it up with big, potentially dangerous prey. Overall, this results in a body that is at least superficially more bear-like and less cat-like. The final product is an extreme super predator that, from the sharp tips of its outsized canines to the end of its often stubby little tail, has been optimized for one thing and one thing alone, killing big animals and killing them quick. Among these separate evolutionary experiments, which one gave us the single most extreme saber tooth of all time. Well, I suspect that many people would pick either the best known and most notorious, Smilodon Populator, the giant saber tooth cat of South America, or perhaps Thylacosmolus atrox, the exceptionally toothy pouched saber tooth, closely related to marsupials and also from South America. And there is little doubt that both represent the most extreme examples within their respective families, the Felidae and the Thylacosmilidae. There's another family we haven't yet looked at in this series that I think produced the most extreme saber-tooth of all. That family is the Nimravidae, and the species is this one, Barbara Felis Fricky. And of course, I will spend most of the rest of this episode explaining just what makes this the most extreme saber-tooth ever. But first, a bit of backstory. Now, just to confuse you, I must point out that some sources place Barbarophilus here in a separate family to the Nimravidae, the Barbarophilidae. But I'm going to follow the most recent classification as proposed by Barrett and Hopkins here in 2024 and treat it as a Nimravid. In this family tree, Barbarophilus and its close relatives form a subfamily within the Nimravidae. For anyone who's particularly interested in the family history, this paper is a free download. Anyway, Regardless of whether you want to call this a family or a subfamily, the star of our show, Barbara Felis Fricky, popped up in southwestern North America around 10 million years ago, and then disappeared from the fossil record around 7.5 million years ago. It seems to have preferred open woodland kinds of environments. There are four other species within the genus, but Barbara Felis Fricky was the largest and most specialised. How big? pretty darn big, about the size of an African lion in terms of body weight. Not as high at the shoulder, but more muscular and robustly built. So, why do I think it was the most extreme? Let's start with the defining feature of 
every mammalian sabre tooth, its upper canine teeth. In Barbarophilus fricki, these were absolutely ginormous. Now, in absolute terms, it's certainly true that the canines of Smilodon, particularly the gigantic Smilodon populator here, were longer. But this monster was an animal around twice its size. In relative terms, the species that I think comes closest is Thylacosmilus here, the pouch saber tooth. Certainly, if we consider the total length of the canine teeth, including the tooth roots, then Thylacosmilus is hard to beat. As you can see here, the roots of its canines extend almost into its brain case. But I would argue that this is not the most important metric here. Nonetheless, no matter how you wash it, many researchers have pointed to Thylacosmilus as a particularly extreme example of the saber tooth body plan. And this includes me. In 2013, along with some colleagues, we published this paper, wherein we compared the mechanical performance of Thylacosmilus to Smilodon and concluded that the pouch saber tooth was clearly the most highly specialised of the two. Anyway, in terms of its function as a weapon capable of inflicting deep penetrating wounds, it's the length of the canines that extend beyond the gum line that matters. And as was recently demonstrated by Talia Pollock and colleagues here just this year, it's not just the length, but the degree to which the canines are curved, laterally flattened or less rounded in cross-section that constitute the extremes of saber-tooth tooth anatomy. These adaptations make it easier to drive the canines through the skin and flesh of the prey animal. However, as with any adaptation, there are trade-offs, cost-benefits. Longer, narrower canines break more easily, and this means that the predator has to be increasingly precise in the delivery of its bite. The longer and thinner the canines, the greater the risk of breakage and the greater the imperative that it must totally secure and immobilise its prey before it drives those canines in. Violent and erratic struggling pose an increasing risk to these highly effective yet vulnerable killing weapons. What happens when we take these metrics into consideration? Well, fortunately, the analyses of Pollock and friends give us some answers. This figure here basically shows us which of these species have the most curved and flattened canines. And on this basis, Barbarophilus is the most extreme, edging out Thylacosmilus and leaving Smilodon in its dust. In this second analysis, we see that, as expected, the canines of Barbarophilus fricki can pass through the hide and flesh of its prey with less force. But in this third analysis, we also see that its canines are the most fragile and easily broken. I would argue that these findings alone pretty clearly demonstrate that Barbarophilus fricki was the most extreme saber tooth ever. Wait, there's more. There are other features of this big Nimravid that push the saber tooth envelope even further. As we can see in this figure by Figueroa et al. 2024, in addition to longer, flatter, and more curved canines, Barbarophilus fricki on the left here has a bunch of more extreme skull features associated with the saber tooth way of life, at least relative to Smilodon on the right. These include upward rotation of the face, which effectively helps to project the canines forward, a reduced bony process on the lower jaw here, which reduces leverage on the main jaw closing muscle, a big flange on the jaw, which obviously acts to protect the vulnerable canines, and the possession of what we call an orbital bar. This last feature is interesting because the only other saber tooth that has it is that other close contender for most extreme saber tooth ever, Thylacosmilus. It's thought that they both needed this structure to prevent their eyeballs from being squashed by their jaw flexing muscles. This itself was a consequence of having such overdeveloped, deeply rooted canine teeth. Indeed, in both Barbarophilus and Thylacosmilus, the roots of the canines are so deep that they push their eyeballs further to the side, reducing 
their field of stereoscopic distance judging vision, as demonstrated in this 2023 paper. Incidentally, it's also been suggested by Naples and Martin here that the ears of Barbara Ophelis were also positioned lower and further to the side of the head. So it's certainly not just the teeth that are extreme in Barbara Ophelis fricky. Now, all that said, there are a couple of potentially confounding findings by previous researchers that I need to talk about. One is the suggestion that Barbara Ophelis had a powerful bite. This is quite often repeated in discussion on the interweb, although I've never actually seen the source of this information identified. If it did have a powerful bite, this would certainly run counter to the trend established for other specialised sabre tooths. But the reality is I've not been able to find a single paper published in the last 20 years that supports this contention. In fact, every paper I've read comes to the opposite conclusion. The only published scientific article I've found suggesting that Barbara Felis had a strong bite is this one by Francois Therian in 2005. Now, Therian didn't actually calculate a bite force for any of the species in his analysis. Basically, what he did is use something we call simple beam theory to predict how resistant the lower jaw was to bending. And this is a very imprecise and I would say fraught method of predicting how hard an animal can bite, even in relative terms. A far more accurate approach is to estimate the forces that the jaw closing muscles can generate and then predict the bite forces on the basis of lever mechanics. This is a relatively simple method, but it gives a way more accurate result. I've used this approach to predict bite forces in dozens of living and extinct species. If you'd like a summary on how we do this, you might like to check out my previous Bite Club episode. Anyway, bottom line is that to date, no one has done this for Barbara Felis. Lautenschlager and friends in 2020 kind of did it in a relative sense, but they didn't provide an actual prediction of absolute bite force. Nonetheless, they did conclude that Barbara Felis had a weak bite. Now, something else I need to address are points raised by Figueroa et al. in 2023 in this paper here. These researchers made a computer assisted comparison of the mechanical performance of Barbara Felis and Smilodon. They concluded that the skull of Barbara Felis was way better adapted to take random forces than the skull of Smilodon was. Basically, this means that its skull was better adapted to resist the kind of random all over the shop kind of forces that you might expect from a big struggling prey animal desperate to escape. Based on this result, they suggest that the big nim rabbit might have used a different killing technique to that of other specialized saber tooths. Perhaps it didn't need to be so precise in the way it applied its killing bite. Maybe it didn't have to secure and so completely immobilize its prey because its skull could take it. Now, this is an excellent study, don't get me wrong, and I don't disagree with the interpretation that the skull of Barbara Felis could take random forces better than Smilodons could. But to conclude that this means it had a different killing technique overlooks the real limiting factor here, the strength of its canine teeth. In practice, it doesn't matter what kind of forces the skull could take unless the canine teeth could take them too. And in the case of Barbara Felis, it's now abundantly clear that its canine teeth were the most fragile and vulnerable to breakage of any sabre tooth. This means that more than any other sabre tooth, Barbara Felis had to make absolutely sure that its prey was very firmly secured before it dealt its death bite. I'll conclude in a minute. But please, before you tune out, like, subscribe, and maybe even donate a few bucks via the thanks tab if you enjoyed this episode. I know my videos ain't the slickest and most professionally edited out there. All the writing and editing is done by me, and I learn as I go. It's a lot of work, but what you get are breakdowns from a very experienced, active scientist and researcher, and there ain't a lot of us out here in YouTube land. Anyway, to wind up, that's my call. 
On the basis of the evidence we have to date, Barbarophilus fricki edges out the pouched Thylacosmalus atrox as the most extreme saber-toothed predator ever. You can let me know what you think in the comments section. Enjoy the rest of your day or night, and I'll be back in another week or so with another episode.